Welcome to Adjunctitis, From Surviving to Thriving, Teaching Hacks to Reduce Stress, Save Time, and Avoid Common Pitfalls. I'm April Brown, an assistant professor of journalism at Cal State LA. In this episode, I have a little help from a friend, Anjali Anderfuren from the University of Michigan. You may have heard her in episode 12. She had years of teaching under her belt by the time we met, and she was among those I turned to for help. Welcome to episode 13, Keeping It Fresh and Setting Boundaries. First, a story. I learned a few hard lessons over COVID. As I've said before, my first year at Cal State LA was entirely virtual. I was teaching from a tiny room in another state and had to create three classes I hadn't taught before from scratch. Some of these were production classes, where students couldn't possibly access the gear we needed to do it properly, because it was locked up on the Forbidden Campus. I did get email right away, which was great for communication, but I didn't have an office phone because, well, I didn't have an office. So I gave students my mobile phone number and told them if it was an urgent problem, they could text me. For the most part, that has served me well, because I only recently learned what my office number is. Unfortunately, though, I've had one student who wanted his questions answered immediately. He didn't seem to understand that I was not on call 24-7. He'd call or text on night and weekends, but mercifully, not before 9 o'clock. I repeatedly told him email is the best way to get in touch unless it was an emergency, keeping in mind that they're having a computer issue five minutes before the deadline at midnight does not qualify as a real emergency. It's in the syllabus. So after more than 10 weeks, when I thought I'd gotten it across, I got another call. I don't answer them. I answer by email and remind him again. But I've already changed all of my future syllabi to reflect the office number I now do have, and it's called boundaries. (laughs) That will be relevant in my conversation with Anjali, But I started this conversation with a question about keeping up enthusiasm in the classroom. You seem to always have a high energy. As long as I've known you, you've been like one of those enthusiastic people, enthusiastic about sharing what you are passionate about. How do you keep that up when over the semester it can be grinding? Sometimes you're teaching the same course multiple times. How do you keep that up? That's a good question, April. I don't know. (laughs) I don't really know how I keep it up. I guess I really do like what I do. And I guess that's the key. I also feel like, I don't know, it's better to be positive in the world. It's super easy to get down on everything. I've definitely been there. And it's hard to come out of that. But I think it's really important for the students to not see too much of that not that you have to not be a person but just so that like at least when you go into the um the classroom or when you're on your email right because it's also a kind of a role you play i have a a friend that both of us used to work with who is an awesome teacher and she used to like to tell me that she feels like she's she puts on a role like she's she's an actor and she goes into the class as professor. And in that class, she does whatever the characteristics of professor are to her. Same thing as like when she's answering emails or doing office hours, like there's a persona that goes with that. And while I don't actually orchestrate anything like that, I think that's a really good idea to keep up the energy when you don't want to, especially at the end of the semester when you're just are like, yes, it's all in the syllabus. I promise if you just looked at it, it would be there. But I think another super important thing that I've learned over time on that same thing about the energy is to set personal boundaries, like to make it clear, like I will answer um, emails all day, you know, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. or 5 p.m. or whatever you're comfortable with on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But no, on Fridays, I'm only going to answer emails till noon. So if you have a question for me, you need to be looking ahead and know that I won't be there to answer your question at 10 p.m. on Sunday. And then you have to hold that for yourself, too. Don't look at your email on 
10 p.m. on Sunday to see if anybody had questions, even if the deadline that you set is 11.59 p.m. on um, Sunday, or if you like to do 9 a.m. on Monday, which is what I prefer because students like to stay up late. Plus, if they have any communication issues, there's that backup little pad of time before my class starts at 9 a.m. But I think that's really important is those personal boundaries make it possible for you to mentally recover before you start the week over again the next week. When did you learn to set personal boundaries? <laughs> um, never. <laughs> no. Um, you know, I don't know. I think it just like came along at some point. I don't know, a couple years into teaching, probably. As somebody who worked in the news, I feel like my entire life was dedicated to work. And there is no respect for personal boundaries. So it's definitely something that I had to learn that my life was not only to serve um, those who needed something from me at, at any time. But it was a good thing to learn because I do think it does come across better to your students when you can be re-energized. And I think it is really important too for your for your mental self. It was definitely before COVID. It's not something I learned the hard way in COVID times. It was something that I just came from teaching. Like, you know, like I need to set a boundary, not only for myself, but also for the students because they need to be good time managers. And if they're always waiting to the last minute, you're not really doing them any favors. So in respect for time, in respect for everyone's time management, if you set those boundaries and then you hold up to them on your end, um, then students are really awesome. They respect those boundaries too. And I tell them, you can email me at any time. It does not matter. But just you know that I'm not going to answer you. And they, they get the hang of it really quick. And then ever since I started doing that, I've, it's really been great in my classes. I actually feel like the emails are more on point. There's less, um, I don't know, it seems less stressful for everyone because everybody tends to organize themselves to the, to the point in which you have them. People rise to the occasion, I think. And I think it's they respect their own time just like they respect your time. And hopefully that rubs off on them too. What are some of the other techniques that you use to help your students be better managers of their own time? Deadlines. Um, I like the hard way. It's zero if it's past the deadline. Uh, it starts out with little things at the beginning of the semester. Like you can earn a lot of small points and stuff in my class because it's about actually doing it and meeting the deadline and you get trained into meeting those deadlines. Yes, there's stuff that can come up. And so I don't like to think of myself as like a hard ass. Like there's never an absolute, right? But I also cannot take everyone's grandma dying. Um, so there's certain protocols to follow that are in my syllabus, to take it back to the syllabus. Um, as long as you follow those um, protocols, I've got you, right? And you've got yourself. Um, so make deadlines for everything, stick to those deadlines, and then treat the deadline with respect. And then I feel like students will as well. I am a very deadline oriented person just in general. I am a big old nerd and I love to do assignments right when I get them. And it was really hard for me actually when I first started teaching to realize that that is not what everybody does. Like, oh, wait, it's hard. It was really, really hard. Like as somebody that's a 4.0 student, even imagining what somebody else's approach to like, be, even though they're serious, completely care about the class, maybe the same, that not everybody's approach is the exact same that I might personally take. Um, so just kind of realizing that as well, like maybe you are a procrastinator, which is also fine, but okay, you recognize there'll be procrastinators. There's people who are great time managers, but just helping them work through the things to the same ways that you helped yourself work through things and be organized. I have students make a list. I like to, I tell people to print stuff out. You know, like in the age of don't print anything, I don't print out most of the things in my class. Everything's digital. But there I tell them like, hey, I would print out the schedule uh, and I would write it on a paper calendar also. And then, yes, set up alarms for on your Alexa like I do or on your phone like I do. Um, put that stuff in wherever you're going to pay attention to it. Those are those are great ways to manage your time. Uh, but, you know, setting lots of small deadlines versus one big deadline, I think, is probably the key. Are there any lessons that you've learned recently since we've had these conversations before, the ones that inspired um, this conversation? And I 
God, I hope we'll have others in the future. But things that you've learned in the last couple of years that have really also, you think, made your life, your teaching life easier that you wish you had known when you started teaching? Oh, I feel like technology is always a, a good one in there. Like I'm somebody who appreciates technology and I like technology. I look, I try to try new things out myself, but I think that that's essential actually to teaching stuff. Um is to see what there's out there and try it out yourself, just like we're doing for the recording of this podcast. Um, hey, there's a new app. Maybe I should try that. Ooh, that is exciting. This makes it so much easier for my students. They could use this in a project. Or I just can't, I like I did, um, the University of Michigan has a really great program that I'm not sure if everybody has a something like this, but I'm sure there's a place you can go at your university that tell us what it is we have, will link to the university of michigan program yes, and there is a lot of stuff just out there for free um, it is like a teaching center um it's a teaching resource center and they have all kinds of uh, workshops that they do throughout the year um and i try to do at least one of those per semester because one way back when in my first master's degree i did a study on burnout in tv news producers and i learned from that burnout inventory, um, which is a scale to find out how burned out you are, um, that the more that you learn, the more you feel positive about your job. Just doing something small, like attending one of these workshops, can get you excited. Then that leads to that energy that we talked about earlier. But it also, this is where you can find so many good tools. Um, like one thing that I recently did, uh, I found about the at this tool called um, Story Map, and it's super easy way to get students to make something that they can be really proud of. You can collaborate, uh, at least for the University of Michigan, it's a free tool and it's integrated within our login. So students don't have to create a new login. They don't have to share their identity or anything like that. Um, it makes it really easy to tell stories on a map with not only text, but also photo and video. Um, you can share them, you can create these story pods, but I learned about it in one of these cool um, webinars that they put on. Um, I think going, taking the time to find, even if you don't have the un your university and you just look online for any kind of resource with little webinars or even pre-recorded things. Like I know I mentioned University of Texas, they've got many free things even. Um, but just looking for places that have like anything that you can do like once per semester that's gonna, give you ideas and hopefully give you something else to go look at. And even if you don't use it, it might lead to something else. Like another one that I um, did was I wasn't really familiar um, in depth with the concept of gamification. That is the idea of making learning into a game, which things like the Weight Watchers app, for example, that's gamification of weight loss. Um, there's people applying this to teaching and I thought, well, that's a really cool idea. And I went down this road of figuring out about this one app and I decided not to use the app. Um, I didn't think all in all it was gonna be a good use of my students' time for what we were gonna do with it. But I did take that concept and applied it to a class to see like, well, let's see if this, Let's see if this makes a difference. Like this is a game, it's gonna be fun. Would it make a difference to students? Um, I did that only for one semester as far as the idea of naming stuff, that gamification, but there was a, actually after that, I've kept some of the assignments that I had made with the idea of gamification, but I realized that my students at least, they didn't need the gamification idea to have a positive response to it, they just needed a cool assignment that was going to meet our learning objectives that it came out of the idea of doing gamification but it didn't need to be labeled that for them but it was something i would have never thought of uh, to do this kind of assignment except for that i happened to be at this thing and they talked about gamification that really piqued my interest so you never know where you're going to find that good stuff i want to be respectful of your time and and i will make an additional appointment to talk about other things but, you know, I know you did a little bit of prep and we did talk about time management and those kind of alternative resources. Was there anything else that you wanted to mention in this session? Gets you excited about teaching that you'd wish you'd known before? I definitely wish that I had known that people just want you, honestly, to do something good, right? They, everybody wants the same thing, no matter how you may feel going into it, even if it's last minute, that like, 
it's not worth stressing. Is this the right thing? If it, if you know they've hired you because you're an expert in whatever it is you're teaching, even though you may not feel like it when you're first going in. So I wish I had known that just going in. It's not worth the stress. Like they hired you for a reason. You trust yourself and just create the class that you want to create. And it's going to be okay. There may be some point where you learn later, oops, I didn't know they all had to do X project because that leads into the, your class is a prereq for something and they had to build on that. Oh, well, you can fix that the next semester. That's okay, but you've taught a good class and they probably can, there's probably something else you had in there that that can be replaced for some little thing like that. But not to worry about all those things at the very beginning, just like make the best class you can and you can always adjust it as you go, whether that's in the semester. Oops, I need to add this one little Thing I did not know I needed. Um, everybody, sorry about that. Um, or if it's just at the next semester when you're revising to like make the class better. Just empower yourself right from the beginning that it is okay. People want that. People want you to teach the best class you can teach. Once again, I have to thank the University of Michigan's Anjali Anderfuren for sharing more of her teaching insights. I've put links to several of the things she referred to on our website adjunctitis.com under teaching tools for episode 13. They include the University of Michigan Center for Research on Teaching and Learning, a survey to measure burnout, which is approved by the National Academy of Medicine, a link to story maps, and also some links to gamification in education. If you have questions or issues you'd like me to address, please send them to questions at adjunctitis.com. Join our conversation on social. Right now we're at adjunctitis on threads, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. We are also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash adjunctitis. You can also use the hashtag adjunctitis so we can form a community where questions can be asked and answered. If you enjoyed our podcast, please consider leaving a review and a rating. Those can help other people find us too. Please spread the word and help those who ask you for help. It's good teaching karma. Adjunctitis is a Look At It This Way production. I'm April Brown. Thank you for listening. Class dismissed.